throughout working at the Neely Center, I've also uh, gotten to meet many people in different areas. Uh, and, and one of the people that have become close friends and great collaborators is Ted Brown. He is the Joe Campbell Endowed Chair in Cinematic Ethics at USC from the School of Cinematic Arts. Um, he's actually working on developing a School of Cinematic Arts campus program, uh, uh, program in ethics. Uh, he is a writer and director of the internationally acclaimed documentary, Darfur Now, uh, and you may, some of you may have heard it, about it. And uh, he's also currently working on a documentary uh, about the Venezuelan conductor, Gustavo Dudamel. So, uh, Ted, I'll leave it to you. A pleasure to welcome, all, welcome you all here. Uh, cinematic ethics is a brand new field. Um, and uh, I feel a little bit like the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, poised on top of the rocket. I'm not going into space because I have any experience, but because they figure I'll come back, and I hope I do. Um, one of the things that uh, we have tried to do in, uh, in, in exploring uh, the field of cinematic ethics and figuring out how best to teach it to our students is to begin with uh, 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 some basic assumptions about what it is that you're doing when you're making a film or producing a television series. And if I can engage you all in a little bit of play with me, um, uh, take a moment to jot down a film that has stayed with you or a television show that has stayed with you. Just jot it down on a piece of paper or your paper napkin or note card there. Um, and then from that film, if you can remember a moment or a, a, a scene, or if it's a TV, TV series, you know, a, a specific episode, a moment or scene from that series. And then beside that, just, again, these are notes. I'm not going to embarrass anyone by asking you to share it with us. But uh, put uh, what you felt at, at, in that scene. Uh, or, or moment, what, what emotion you were, you were stirred by or stirred to feel. Um, one of the things that uh, we try to ask our students to do is to uh, identify as best they can um, what it is that inspired them to come to the School of Cinematic Arts and try to imagine what it is that they're trying in that same way to replicate for the audiences for their own films. Um, and so in this way, um, I think if you were to go and look, you would be able to both remember something very specific about that film or that television show, and you'd also be able to identify what you were feeling at that time. And in some core way, our job as creators of stories is to deliver to audiences an emotional, unforgettable experience. We're trying to make things that are memorable and moving. And I bet if I were to ask you, how many of you have laughed out loud in a movie theater? And so you don't have to actively embarrass yourselves. Uh, how many of you with your hands still up, those of you who have laughed out loud in a movie theater? How many of you have also shed a tear in a movie theater? or jumped with fright, right? So the kind of emotions that we trade in are emotions that are powerful enough to provoke a physiological response, right? Tears, jumping, right? Laughing out loud. So we're working with strong stuff. Um, and in, in working with strong stuff and in trying to deliver that strong emotional and unforgettable experience to viewers, we look for rules or guidelines to govern what we, what we are up to. Um, but unlike the students at Keck who, when they get their degrees, will stand and take an oath, right? The students of ours at the shrine, in a few short weeks, who will collect their sheepskins, or it's an ersatz sheepskin, they'll get the actual one later, don't have to stand and swear. But I ask them sometimes, what would you swear if you had to swear? swear an oath. And it would have to be a very broad oath to encompass the incredible range of, uh, of kinds of stories that our students would, would want to bring in the world. Everything from fart comedies to important social action documentaries, right? And I think at the end, after we talk about this a lot, my students and I come to the conclusion that the, 
the one uniting element to all of the work that uh, they do, and this is them at the shrine taking a pledge, is to avoid boredom at all costs. <laughs> it's simple, but at its most basic, if you lose the audience, whatever message you might be hoping to deliver will never be received. In the process of producing this work, of course, our students, and they all aspire to be directors, most of them, are going to be forced uh, to confront an enormous number of decisions, right? There are going to be decisions about information, what kind of camera should I use, what speed should it be operating at. There'll be questions uh, requiring them to act, you know, uh, at what time are we going to begin this shoot, um, how many people need to be moving at such and such a time. But the questions that, of course, engage us are, are questions of right and wrong, us as the people gathered here and the students that I teach. What's the right thing to do? And how, in the field of cinematic arts, where you're trying to create something that's emotional and unforgettable, and that is not boring, how do you come to a decision about what that is? Unlike medicine and law and even journalism, we don't have codes. And to some extent, that freedom has been an indispensable part, that freedom from any kind of code, has been an indispensable part of what's made the art form so vital. And it's certainly that, that desire to be unfettered and free is a huge part of the impulse that brings our students to Los Angeles to study with us. They want to be pushing the boundary. They want to be creating something that hasn't existed before. So in that context, you have to think about ethics in a in a very flexible way. It can't be viewed by our students as a constraint. The discussion has to be an engaged, very flexible one, not a finger-wagging one from the pulpit. And it has to recognize that the art form includes work from Citizen Four, you know, to Leni Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, from uh, one birth of a nation to another, and from uh, the works of uh, crazy John Waters to the beautiful tender films of Pixar. So one of the questions I faced in trying to figure out how best to bring the ethical conversation to students of cinema was in this context, in the absence of a code, in a forum in which students crave freedom and uh, have a resistance to constraint, how, how to introduce the subject. And my conclusion, uh, as was the conclusion of many of my colleagues who are teaching this subject in other fields and several of the student presenters, was to put before them real problems, problems that we had encountered as practitioners in the field. And this had a number of, uh, it, it swam with the stream of a number of inclinations of mine, and it swam with the stream of my own experience. I, uh, I'm not a trained ethicist. Uh, I studied my share of philosophy as an undergrad, but my field of expertise, as much as it was, anything was in aesthetics. I was interested in art, not ethics, right and wrong. Um, but I did bring experience uh, and a tremendous amount of work in the field of cinema, particularly in documentary, confronting difficult ethical questions. And so it both fed my own experience as well as a sort of pedagogical pragmatism to put before the students practical questions. And I want to share one of them with you today um, uh, uh, that I, I think will help you grasp um, both how we're approaching it and some of the specific kinds of questions that are unique to cinema. Uh, one of the great benefits of working this way is it gives our students a chance to exercise their decision-making capacity and also gives them a chance to develop the ability and the facility for fielding uh, difficult ethical questions. Um, because as we all know from our own uh, work, uh, these types of questions hit you uh, at unexpected moments, not when you're in a, uh, a place of reflection. And the decisions often, often have to be made in the blink of an eye. And so by giving our students a chance to practice and in a way rehearse, we're, we're forwarding or affording them a chance to sharpen uh, a capacity that will be taxed uh, in a very high pressure situation most often. This was the case with me. I was in Sudan. I was directing a feature documentary, Darfur Now. Um, it looked at the Darfur crisis. This is almost 10 years ago now. 
through the lives of six people trying to bring an end to it. Three of those people were outside Sudan, and while I was in the country, I found three other subjects. Um, and one of these subjects was the leader of a camp for the internally displaced. The internally displaced is a designation for refugees who remain within their own country. Um, in uh, Darfur, there were between one and a half and two million people displaced from their homes, largely because their villages had been burned to the ground and they'd been driven from their property, um, either by the government or by proxy militias aligned with the government. Imagine, if you will, the entire population of Vermont and New Hampshire, I'm from New England, evacuated from those states and forced to live in Maine. And you have some idea of the scale of the crisis there. So uh, one of the subjects of the film was a leader of this IDP camp called Hamadiya. His name was Sheikh Mohammed Abakar. And we were in that camp um, filming him. Um, and filming his work with the, with the residents of the camp. These are all people who had been displaced from their home and were living um, with the permission of the government in an environment that was supported by the international aid community. One of the conditions of uh, their life in the, gov uh, in, in the camp was that they could not be a harbor, a safe haven for criminals. That was one of the conditions that they had negotiated with the government. Another of the conditions was that there could be no arms inside the camp. The reasons for this are fairly obvious. Most of the, most of the people who were in the camp were furious with the government uh, and were a, a natural source uh, of support for the rebellion that was going on. So these were the general terms, or some of the general terms, under which the sheikh was leading this camp. 